wants my, my ass. I'm only four. Bonjour, monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. Start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I am your host, and today we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is another in-between season bonus episode, where I reflect on the decade of shorts we've passed, look to the decade ahead of us, and at the end I'll give some recommendations of the nominees we've discussed and some shorts that went unnominated. Uh, This episode, as we look back on the 1950s, the main topic of discussion is the downfall of the theatrical animated short and the closure of most of the major animated short studios. We discussed the stories of a few of the companies in the individual episodes, but I figured it best to get a whole summary right here in one episode. Before we get into the episode, though, I just want to thank all the guests I've had on the podcast in the last season. So thank you to Noah Pasternak, Zara Wood, Brandon Stanwick, Owen Daly, Luke Gill, Ronaldo Sosa twice, uh, Jacob Sanchez, Christoph, and Madeline Moss. I'm always so grateful to have anyone willing to spend an hour with me talking about short films, and especially people who make it just so, so fun. I look forward to whenever y'all come back to the pod, and I'm excited for the next 10 episodes of guests as well. As usual, there will be some familiar voices and some completely new to the pod. I can't wait for you all to hear them. Anyways, back to the death of the studio animated shorts. Uh, Let's start with UPA with its meteoric rise and fall. Uh, As we know, UPA started off the decade strong, achieving massive popularity and acclaim with Gerald McBoing Boing winning the 1950 award, and their Mr. Magoo character became an overnight sensation as well. Well, However, things started taking a downturn when the government got involved. This was the middle of the Red Scare in the United States, a period where the government was cracking down hard on suspected communists or communist sympathizers, and the House Un-American Activities Committee was the main center of investigation. Uh, In 1952, they made their way to the doors of UPA, a company which had its roots in labor strikes against Walt Disney, so it's fair to say that there were plenty of left-leaning employees in their midst. It was, in fact, Columbia Pictures, UPA's distributor, that gave HUAC a list of eight names. Seven of them appeared before the committee denounced communism and named names. Only one, John Hubley, refused. Because of this, Hubley was formally blacklisted from Hollywood and forced to leave UPA. I'm not saying that John Hubley was like the sole thing holding UPA up, but he was one of their leading creatives and finest directors. Losing Hubley in 1952 is like if MGM had lost Hannah and Barbera only a couple years after Tom and Jerry got big. But really, the story of the fall of these studios is the same all around. People went to movie theaters less thanks to the rise of television. At the start of the decade, the studios tried to fight against it by providing things you can't get on television. We saw many shorts be produced in CinemaScope with widescreen and lush colors you can't get on television. And even in like the 1953-1954 area, the animated studios shut down for a bit, like Warner Brothers and MGM, uh, to focus on like like trying to develop uh, 3D shorts. But these ended up not going really anywhere. Uh, But as the decade went on, studios were realizing that they just aren't able to make as much money as they used to, so they cut costs. Those costs that were cut were to the short animation studios, which were a lot more expensive than regular live-action shorts and a lot less profitable than anything else the studio was making out. Uh, For UPA, they were already a studio who were making their shorts of low budgets, so when they had their low budgets, they needed to focus on their shorts that they they knew made money. Their biggest moneymaker was Mr. Magoo, so in the latter half of the decade, you see more and more of UPA's output become solely Magoo shorts. In 1959, UPA released seven short films. Six of those were Mr. Magoo, and one was from the Ham and Hattie series, which was notable for being two different shorts in one cartoon. Also in 1959, in a last-ditch effort to make some money, they released a feature film, 1001 Arabian Nights. It tells the classic Aladdin tale, with Mr. Magoo also being there as Aladdin's uncle. The film was a total flop, and so next year, 1960, Stephen Basustow, who founded UPA, sold the company to Henry G. Saperstein, 
who promptly focused the studio into making content solely for television. Then, after working in TV through the 60s, Zapperstein ceased all animation production in 1970, though kept the rights to UPA characters. In the span of just two decades, UPA went from the forefront of popular revolutionary animation to just making cheap animated series, milking old brands, to completely defunct outside of a company that owned the brands. Also, uh, UPA became the American distributor for Toho, somehow, the Japanese production company famous for the Godzilla films. This fact just really makes me want a crossover where Mr. Magoo fights Godzilla. Uh, well, the time for that has passed. Uh, the next studio we'll analyze is MGM, another one of the titans of the animated short Oscar. Its demise was much more sudden than UPA's. It had faced budget cuts starting in 1954, though ironically they were also asked to make their shorts in CinemaScope. Have half the budget for a frame three times as big? Do the math on that. But in any case, MGM persisted. In 1955, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, the Tom and Jerry directors, took over producer duties as, as Fred Quimby retired. But suddenly, MGM pulled the plug on its animation studio in 1957, preferring to just re-release older shorts in theaters than make new ones. This left Hanna-Barbera looking for a new avenue, and eventually found a new home in television. MGM did later seek out other people to make Tom and Jerry shorts, starting with Gene Deitch in 1961, but never to the same quality or success as before. And Tom and Jerry found their way to television in 1965. And as for Hanna and Barbera, well... You know, you probably know how that turned out. Flintstones, Jetsons, all that good stuff. But moving on, let's look at Warner Brothers next. The beginning of the end starting in, started in 1955 when Warner Brothers sold nearly 200 of their old black and white cartoons to Guild Films to be shown on television. However, Warner Brothers lasted significantly longer than some of its competitors. There was a lot of staff shakeups in 1958, including the retirement of producer Edward Selzer, being replaced by John W. Burton. But the studio kept chugging along, but they were not immune to the allure of television, and in 1960, a Bugs Bunny show began airing, featuring cartoons not sold in the prior Guild Films Exchange. But death comes for us all, and after another producer shakeup with David H. DePatty taking over in 1961, Warner Brothers shut down its animation studio in 1964. There were still Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies made after that, but they were licensed out to the newly formed DePatty Freeling Enterprises, which just so happened to be comprised of former Warner Brothers animators. DePatty Freeling Enterprises will actually end up being the longest-lasting animation studio specializing in theatrical shorts, as they kept making short films for theaters up until the end of the 70s, several years past any other competitor, in particular with their Pink Panther series of cartoons. Now, I know some of you there, some of you out there might be asking, where does Chuck Jones fit into all of this? And I bet if you're asking that, you probably already know the answer. Chuck Jones, as well as Frizz Freeling, were two of the major directors that stuck with Warner Brothers up to the end, despite all the shakeups and hardships. However, before Warner Brothers' closure, Chuck Jones was fired. That's because he did some work with our good friends UPA on their second animated feature, Gay Paris, released in 1962 and did the whole Cats in Paris thing earlier and better than Disney's Aristocats. Uh, Chuck Jones co-wrote the story on it, but when Warner Brothers picked up the film to for distribution, they found out Jones bro broke his exclusivity contract and let him go in 1963. Where did Jones go next? Why to MGM, of course. He took his Warner Brothers team and formed Sib Tower 12 Productions and worked for MGM on some Tom and Jerry shorts after they parted ways with Gene Deitch and Rembrandt Films. Uh, starting in 1963 and up to 1970, Sib Tower 12, later called MGM slash Visual Arts, Arts uh, ended up making 34 Tom and Jerry shorts, two standalone shorts, including the Oscar-winning The Dot and the Line, a television show, three television specials, which includes the famous How the Grinch Stole Christmas TV special, and a feature film, The Phantom Tollbooth. Uh, this studio then closed down in 1970, and Chuck Jones fact found himself back at Warner Brothers with another animation studio, Chuck Jones Enterprises, which was television-focused, and where he stayed until the end. Now, Disney is an interesting case, as this was a company built around animation rather than a larger film company who had a sub subsidiary make man-made shorts. Plus, outside of the realm of their animated features and shorts, 
Disney also had multiple television shows and the new Disneyland theme park, but they were still hit hard by the loss of profits in the film industry. Disney phased out many of their characters like Mickey and Goofy by 1953, uh, not including the a goofy short Aquamania in 1963, and eventually shut down their short film division in 1956. From then on, any and, all, any and all short films made by Disney were done via their feature animation department. This largely amounted to educational short films in the 1960s, though Disney never truly gave up on short films. They always made sure to make one every few years. Now we come up on the two afterthoughts when thinking back on theatrical animation. Walter Lynch Productions, and Terry Toons. I, I don't mean to be so hard in these two companies. It's just they're both very infamous for their cheap, low-quality cartoons, and they're not very fun to watch either, although Walter Lance has some fun stuff when it comes to Tex Avery working for him. But how do these companies fare when their budgets are slashed even more than they already had? Well, like cockroaches in a nuclear apocalypse, they did all right. Both companies made shorts for distribution for both theaters and television up until 1972. However, Walter Lance had kept Walter Lance as the head of that whole time, while Terry Toons changed hands repeatedly. I guess when you're already used to making shorts for no money, having even less money doesn't change much. And that's it. That was the death of the theatrical animated short, at least as far as Hollywood is concerned. The coming decade, the Oscar will present us with a lot of foreign and independent animators, and it'll be a while before we regularly see major Hollywood studios competing again, outside of the occasional Disney short, of course. And I know this whole episode has been taken, has taken a truly somber tone, but I want to emphasize that this is not a sad occasion. We have been freed from the shackles of, of standard Hollywood filmmaking, and we are wading into the wide ocean of animated shorts. We are going to see a lot of weird and interesting shit. Some will be good, some will be bad, but it'll be unlike we've seen anything we've seen before in this category. Strap in. But before we end this bonus episode, I have some recommendations to give, starting with my top 10 nominees from the 1950s. Number 10, Birds Anonymous. A funny Looney Tunes short where Sylvester tries to kick his bird-eating habit. Uh, it might be a lesser version of last decade's Life with Feathers, but I love it just the same. Uh, number nine is Crazy Mixed Up Pup, a wild, zany, non-stop cartoon about a man and a dog who essentially trade personalities. There's a gag every second, not much of it makes sense, but it's just so crazy that you can't help but laugh. Number eight, The Jaywalker. Perhaps UPA's last great short. It's got very dry humor about a mild-mannered man who finds himself addicted to jaywalking. Complete with UPA's di distinct animation style and jazzy editing and score, it's a hilarious and gorgeous short to behold. Number 7. Rugged Bear. Humphrey Bear is seeking shelter from the hunt and finds himself fame and famed hunter Donald Duck's cabin and pretends to be his rug. Does essentially every gag you can do with its concept and does them all well. Number six, The Truth About Mother Goose, tells the stories behind three different nursery rhymes, and while the segments are lopsided in terms of their length, the beautiful animation and genuinely engaging histories behind each rhyme make this short a great experience. Number five is Madeline, or Madeline. Uh, while it's basically just a retelling of the popular children's story, the story is still endlessly charming, and UPA brings the gorgeous illustrations to life. Number four is Gerald McBoing Boing, the short that made UPA a force to be reckoned with. Uh, Dr. Seuss's story paired with the genius of Robert Cannon as director, you end up with a quintessential animated short, and this should be studied in schools. It is just that good. Number three, The Two Mouseketeers. This is one of the most recognizable Tom and Jerry shorts, and for good reason. Setting a Tom and Jerry short in pre-revolution France turns out to be a genius idea, bringing new life to Tom and Jerry after a decade of short films before it. Plus, Nibbles is adorable, as always. Number two, Rudy Toot Toot. A perfect mix of music and visuals, so exciting and fun. A delightful story of love and murder. The animation being so bouncy and colorful and energetic and beautifully designed. Uh, one of UPA's great masterpieces. And number one, The Telltale Heart.
This is not only the best short of this decade, but it is the best nominee so far, and one of my favorite shorts of all time. It brings the Edgar Allan Poe story to life with James Mason's eerie narration in a world so utterly gothic and horrific. It's hard to explain why this short is so perfect, but it truly is a perfect piece of animation. And if you are a fan of animation or horror or both, you must see this. That's it for the nominees, but what about the unnominated? Well, I feel like I don't have to tell you about how great Warner Brothers' output it is at this time, especially with the likes of What's Opera Duck, Duck Amuck, and The Rabbit of Seville. But there's some less appreciated films of theirs at this time, like The Three Little Bops, Bully for Bugs, and To Hair is Human. For Disney, there are two great Donald Shorts of love from this period, Out of Scale, where Chip and Dale take home Donald's Take Home in Donald's Train Set, and Let's Stick Together, a genuinely sweet and heartwarming short where Donald befriends a bee. I have a couple shorts not from Hollywood. Firstly, Norman McLaren's Blackbird, and secondly, Cow on the Moon by Dolshan Vukotic from Zagreb Film. Uh, if you listen to some of these last few episodes, you probably heard me scream my praises for Phlebas by, by Gene Deitch, and that still rings true as does my praise for some shorts by Faith and John Hubley, The Adventures of Asterix, and especially The Tender Game, which is my favorite animated short of all time. Also, I just watch anything and everything by UPA this decade that doesn't feature Mr. Magoo's face on it. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you, listener, for tuning in. This has been the short podcast about short films. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>